Hi, everyone, and welcome to Thursdays with Troy. I, as always, am Troy Lambert, mystery author, editor, super plotterer, and your host. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to flash fiction and short story writer Travis J. Crokin, a.k.a. The Calm Scribe, as he's known online, uh, based in Canada, where he's just told me that the air hurts his face. Travis hosts a writing discussion show on Twitch, has published a YA novel and a kid's book, and is currently working on a new novel and a book of short stories. Welcome, Travis. Tell us a little bit about yourself and the kind of short stories that you write. Thank you very much, Troy, and thank you for having me. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Travis Crokin, and I write short stories, novels, uh, micro fictions, uh, flash fictions, and generally I work in the areas of, uh, or the genres of thriller, horror, mystery, science fiction. My newest novel is science fiction right now. Oh, excellent. I, I love the mix of genres. That's a lot of fun. I actually love to write in various different genres as well. So one of the things we want to talk about right away is that obviously um, I love short stories. You can practice writing and developing characters and plot. Um, you can send them to a number of publications, so you can make money off of writing short stories. And you can use them on your website to showcase your writing ability to agents, editors, readers, all that kind of thing, and you can get readers invested in your stories. And in my opinion, a strong plot is just as important, maybe more so, in short fiction as it is in long fiction. So let's talk about that in particular for a few minutes. Tell me about planning short fiction for you. Where do you start? Oh, that's a very good question. I usually start with an idea. Uh, it's typically either a major scene or an end of a story or just a concept that I want to get across. And I kind of weigh it and decide how much time, how many words do I need to get this point across or to get this story across. And that's going to be if it's a short story or a novel or a flash fiction. And at that point, I just kind of take the idea and I start condensing it down into a semblance of what I think will get the story across properly and within the word count that I'm looking for. And I start plotting out key points and uh, kind of signposts of how I want to get to where I want to be. Excellent. So how do you think reader expectations differ from short stories to novels? Or do they? I would say that they do. I kind of liken a novel more to a nice romantic walk with someone where they're expecting having your hand held. You're going through some ups and downs. There's some excitement. There's some lulls in the conversations. There's some quiet moments. And if someone says something silly, it can usually be forgiven. And the, the, the walk can continue on. Whereas with a short story, it's not quite that. It's a little more truncated, and you have to be able to grab the attention immediately and carry the attention and the focus through the entire short story, have a very tight, solid plot without a lot of plot holes. You Obviously, you can't keep the reader constantly going on and up, so you do have to have the lulls, but I find those lulls are a lot smaller, and you don't have the same space for mistakes. If you have a dead space in your story, you lose the reader. Whereas a novel, they can remember other, other things and kind of forgive that one bad chapter and persevere on. Very true. So we could combine that to kind of like speed dating. You know, a, a short <laughs> yeah. story is speed dating. If you're going to use the dating analogy, short story is speed <laughs> dating. And a novel is more of the longer relationship where you have some opportunities to mess up and forget a holiday or something. I think there's one coming up. So you, you told us you write in different genres, at least a few different genres. Um, do you approach those different genres in different ways? It depends. Uh, I would say yes at uh, first. My first instinct would be to say no, but I would say actually yes in that uh, thrillers, I tend to go uh, just more fast-paced and straightforward in my writing, whereas if it's something that's going to be a mystery or a kid's book or something, I take a lot more of a relaxed time and kind of play around with different ideas more. Um, and then again, if it goes into something that I occasionally do for different competitions and things like romance or comedy, I take that very, uh, very different approach. Right, exactly. Those are, those are actually obviously very different genres. Not that it's not fun to play around um, with those things. So what I'm going to do is right now I'm going to share your plotter file that mm -hmm. you shared with me. And we're going to start 
Now, the file, file is titled RP Halloween, but there's actually two stories in here. One's RP 2020 Christmas. And so we're going to talk about that particular file first. We'll start with the timeline, because I see you've organized that by your main plot and then your characters underneath. When you wrote this story, did the plot come first? Did the characters come first? How did that play out for you? Uh, for this story, it was the plot that came first, and then the character of the giant was uh, a close second to that. And once I kind of had an idea, and I discussed it actually on stream with my chat, and once I kind of solidified what idea I wanted to work with, then I figured out which characters needed to be included in the story. Excellent. And I see that across the top, you use beats to outline your this short story and the other one that we'll look at shortly in Plotter. Can you walk us through how you plan a story? So where do you start? Do you start with the characters and put them into Plotter? Or do you start with your timeline and work like your main plot that you've come up with and kind of work from there, work them around that? I generally will start with the main plot of what I want to have happen and lay out the beats as to what are going to be the key points, the, again, kind of flexible sign points or signposts of along the path of where I want to go. Uh, and I kind of write to those points as I go along. And then as I'm looking at each beat and what I want to have happen, that will kind of dictate to me which characters need to be involved and how many characters are involved in that. Gotcha. Okay, so let's look at one of your beats here, kind of the, the opening beat obviously of this story, um, of the children baking cookies with Dan. So tell us about this. Was this the setting the normal? How are you using this particular beat? I was using this beat as a kind of a cute opportunity or a moment to pull people into the story, uh, to make them feel really at home, because it is a short story and I needed to get their attention quickly. Uh, so I wanted it to be something familiar to people, the idea of baking Christmas cookies, kids in the, in the kitchen with mom and dad. So I thought that if there was a nice, welcoming, warming opening to the story, then that's going to kind of pull in people's attention for this, especially seeing it was based around a Christmas story. Right, exactly. Okay, so can you tell us about the story arc for this particular story? Because it seems like a fairly simple one, but seven beats, it's it's fairly compact. So tell us about the like the overall story arc. The overall story arc is uh, solid lessons for the children within the story. So in essence, what it is, is a group of normal children that decide they want more uh, gifts than they're stocking at Christmas time. And they the older uh, sibling decides that the best way for them to do that is to sneak into the giant's house and steal one of the giant or some of the giant socks because they would get a lot more stuff in bigger socks. And so that's where the story goes. The children come up with this idea. They go, they plan the heist. They see that the giant is lonely and by himself having tea with teddy bears. And they break into the house and they steal uh, when the giant leaves to go do something and they steal some of his socks and go back home. It's not until when they get home, they realize that the giant's letter to Santa Claus is in the sock, and that was the final day that it would make it to the North Pole on time. So the kids then have to go through this kind of lesson and understanding of what would happen if our letter to Santa Claus went missing, what would we do? So they were quite distraught and they had to wait until the next day to try to return the letter. Uh, so they did almost the right thing by returning the letter, but they didn't go all the way because they didn't return the socks. So the giant then kind of nudges them. They apologize, he accepts the apology, and they invite him over for Christmas dinner. And he says that he can't accept until they have permission from their parents and until they do the right thing and return his socks. And when the uh, kids come back, he has socks for them and he does attend the Christmas dinner. So the whole arc is just having an idea of this idea to get more gifts. And they do, they break their Christmas spirit by doing the wrong thing, by stealing from someone in their community. And they almost get themselves to the right thing by themselves, but they still need that little bit of a touch from an adult to help them get that way. And uh, in the end, it kind of wraps up nicely where they've learned a valuable lesson and they've also given the giant what his Christmas wish was, and that was to have friends. So we get down to the end and obviously it's a, it's a happy ending. This is more of a kid's story, almost a, almost a Christmas-like fairy tale. So the giant is more of a, of a man and hole type plot. Yes. Thing. And then the kids are, is more of a flowing upward arc, you know, where they find, they get the th things that they want, but there's a cost, of course, for getting those things. 
so that and then everybody returns to normal so that's actually a really good and i i love your detail in these particular scene cards because it really gives you something pretty solid to write to and i think in your character timelines if we look at those so we look at this one where it talks about apologies and returns and there's a lot of details here that actually gives you a lot to just fill out with a short story so how do the number of beats how does that impact how long your short stories are the number of beats, as I said before, are basically what key action points that I want to have happen in the story. And if I know that for this one, I had a limit of 20 minutes reading the story and I knew how many words I needed to have built into that. So if I get to about, say, beat four and if I've got a 5000 word story maximum and I'm already sitting at 3500 words, then that lets me know that I need to be more concise in my thinking and my writing, what I'm doing. I'm not editing as I'm going, but I'm not being as airy with my thinking. I'm kind of, uh, I will go past my mark of 5,000 words and edit back, but that prevents me from throwing down a full 20,000 words and having to edit a lot more back. Uh, so this just kind of allows me to see where I am with my pacing, with my word count and where I am in the story to get to that point. And one point I wanted to add to this too is, with, and is that's one of the things I love about Plotter is that I was a cyclist and hit by a car over seven years ago and left with permanent uh, brain injury and I have memory issues. So Plotter is a fantastic thing that I can go in if I take a few days off my story, I can go back and look at my notes very quickly and get right back into where I was without a lot of lost time. So Plotter is just a fantastic, has fantastic opportunities to keep you on pace with your story. And if you need to take a few days away from it, you can come back with ease and not have to worry about wasting time getting caught up. That is an excellent point. That's actually what I was going to talk to you about next is pacing, basically, is how Plotter enables you to ensure that you're on the right pace like this one. So you obviously had a goal of um, I need to read this story in 20 minutes type yes. thing. So that kind of determines your pacing, but that also, you know, you could still have a slower or fast story in that. So I was actually going to ask you how the beats affect the pacing and the way that you you set up your story that way. Uh, that's a good question. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say, again, for the pacing is you can kind of see when you look have even looking at the view that we have here with this, uh, like I was saying before, you don't want to have fast action all the way through, you need to have some pauses and some breaths for the reader to go through the story. And when you're looking at it like this with Plotter, you can actually see very clearly what your pacing is. And if you have just increased action, increased action, increased action, and then you can look and say, okay, I need to either move beat three behind beat four, because that will put a slowdown in between, or I need to add in another beat and put in a breath for the reader to kind of get caught up to the action of what was happening. So just the overall, it's this timeline view is fantastic. It gives you an overall view where you can actually very succinctly see how fast your pace, pace is moving and where you need to chop it up a little bit. Right. And I actually like that this one, the found object, seems to be kind of a letdown of the pace. The, the giant is frantic. He's looking through his stuff, searching for the lost thing. And then here we just have the kids back home looking through the socks and they find his letter. So I think that's a great idea. It's a great setup right there for just releasing that tension for just a few minutes. So that's it. You did an excellent job, an excellent job with that one. Thank okay. You. So well, now we're going to switch gears actually, and I'm going to look at your other file because it is a little bit different. Your Halloween file. And if you guys didn't see how I switched between those two, I simply did it up here. Um, there's a drop down menu. You can also go to the project and switch there, but there's a drop down menu for those of you who are not as familiar with Plotter. And you can just switch between the different timelines that you have in your Plotter. And I just switched to the Halloween one because we're going to talk about that one a little bit now because there are obviously some more characters in this one. It is also a bit longer. So tell us again about this one. You mentioned that you had basically 10 places 10 topics and a certain word count for each tell us a little bit about that so what happened with this story is that uh my community association decided that because christmas or halloween sorry was effectively canceled due to the current pandemic situation the community association were building programs and ideas that create a very fun event for the kids one of those was for me to create a flash fiction story based in the community 
So we put out on social media and asked people to give an, an object, a monster, and a location within the community. And the original idea was to use three of each and build a story, a short story that again was read on Halloween evening live on Facebook for the community. I received 10 of each category. So I decided to do all of them. And I even included a couple of extras on, on my own. So there are 10 objects, 10 monsters, and 10 locations in the community. And this story is a lot more of a fast pace uh, and done in a flash fiction style format. Excellent. And so I see, I was just going to look here. So you basically have 12 beats because there's one missing there in the beginning. So those must be the 10 plus your two. And I like that you can, you basically your main plot is your, looks like your locations. And then yes. you have a number of characters that you've added in below here. So that is actually, first of all, it's a fantastic thing that you did for your community. So how, how long were each of these beats and how did that go? Just tell us how that went. Uh, it, it went very, very well. It was very well received. I believe in the end there was, I think it was over 10,000 people saw the reading of the video. Oh, wow. Or the video of the reading. It was interesting. It was fast paced. And that's the reason why there are so many beats. And the beats were very quick because, again, it was a story written for children. So it couldn't be too scary. Gotcha. I wanted to be safe with it. And for the tension spans, it was kept to about 15, 20 minutes of a reading. So each beat is very quick and it's basically how they're heading out, where they interact, cross paths with a monster, how they get out of it, and then they move to the next. So this story doesn't have as many pauses and breaths for the reader or the listener. This is more of a fast paced action, pretty solid through the story. Well, right. And I also see that obviously in your scene cards, obviously you don't have as much detail because these are very flash, very short fiction. Because to read all of these in 20 minutes would be you know, pretty spectacular. Each one would have to be pretty quick. So again, excellent job on that one. I actually really like your um, your way of doing this and the way you've done this for your community. How does this relate to how you write other short stories? Do you do it similarly on pretty much each level? You know, each time you do a short story as far as um, just assembling the beats and looking at your pacing and how long it's going to take to tell the story or how does that work for you? Well, for my typical short stories, what I do is I'll take down the main idea and my short stories will start either the end of the story or a key scene that I've uh, written or that I want to write. And I'll start putting those down as plot points or beats as I'm going along. Gotcha. And that's the thing that I love about Plotter is that I don't work in a linear fashion. I don't start at the end and go or start at the beginning and go to the end or even backwards that way. Uh, so because my brain is all over the place and I'm writing these different scenes and coming up with these different ideas, I can throw them down and then very quickly move the scene cards around and realize this one shouldn't be here and that one should like, switch things. And actually the story I'm currently working on on my Twitch stream is a novel and it's The Lion of Arctionomus, a science fiction novel, and it started as a short story. And I was plotting it with Plotter doing the same method. But then the ideas kept coming and it kept growing and kept growing and then when I realized that the initial meeting between the two main characters was now happening in chapter seven, effectively, I realized that it was becoming more of a novel. And I was able to really quickly shift gears and turn that into a novel structure for the story that I was working on. But for short stories, I put out the points, move them around and see, again, I've, the overall view and timeline view allows me to see how the story flows and if I've got any characters that aren't doing something they should be doing or if I've got any obvious plot holes. Excellent. Well, we're going to go back to your screen for one second because I want to look at a couple other things. And, and that's how you use the characters and places in here. So I see that you're, you've got your number of characters. There's some of them that are obviously a little more developed as far as with photos and things like that. But you ha seem to have like this the first one, the Banshee, you have a significant amount of information here about the walking ghost. Does the amount of information you put here just depend on the story and how much this walking ghost, how big of a role it plays in the story? Or do you always develop your characters pretty fully, even if you don't let the reader necessarily see all that? The You're right in the sense that with the Banshee, she was the main uh, antagonist through the entire story. Uh, so that's why she has more information written in about her. Uh, however, for my main characters, I will go very in depth. Uh, my followers know that I do resumes, I do their past histories, their friends, their friendships, their childhood friends, their childhood imaginary friends. I go fully in depth and I create the character and 
just their entire life, basically, that the reader never really sees. And, but in a sense, they do pick that up. And secondary characters and tertiary characters, I don't go as in-depth for that. The less important of a character, the less detail I go into. But if I write the character and I design it and I know who they are, how they are, and what makes their personality be what it is, when I'm writing them in any given situation, I don't have to sit and waste time wondering how would they react. I know how they would react. If your best friend were to be in a car accident, you know how they would react in that situation. And that's what I try to do with my characters is to get to know them so well and so intimately that it's almost like they're sitting beside me whispering in my ear what they're doing in the story. I absolutely love that. I am a character-driven writer myself, and I absolutely adore that. That is a fantastic summary of how well you should really know your characters. Now we'll move on to places, because I just wanted to touch on this really briefly, how you use places. Because for me, places often also become characters in the story to a certain extent. Obviously, this one, you probably, for the Halloween one, you probably put all these in there just so you can remember all the different places <laughs> that you were given. So tell us yeah. how places work for you and how you develop your settings. Uh, that is exactly it. There were so many places I had to and make sure that they were done in the right order. So I needed to know logically how the children could run through the community in a loop and get back home. So the placing of the places in the storyline, it was very uh, significant for me going through. But I tend to, in sitting down and interviewing my characters, I tend to do the same thing where I will visually put myself in my imagination standing in the middle of the scene, in the location within the scene, and look around and see if there's anything that I wasn't anticipating, anything that kind of pops up that, you know, hidden behind that tree over there, or how does this location interact with or the distance from it to the next location. If I cannot connect to my characters and to my story and to my locations, I can't expect my readers to. So I place myself in these locations and walk around like the reader would to see how I feel and how I connect. And if I'm feeling blah about the space, I know my reader is not going to connect to it either. Absolutely. That is fantastic. Well, one last thing we're going to talk uh, over in Plotter, and then I'll, we'll stop sharing our screen and talk about a couple other things. So the export process, what software do you write in? How does that export process impact your writing? What, how, do you, how does that work for you? The export process is fantastic with this. And that's one of the things that really drew me in. Uh, it was the ease of use of this program and the exporting. So what I do is I use Grammarly for my uh, for a lot of my editing. I use Scapel for a lot of my kind of brainstorming and just throwing down ideas, which is a sister product of Scrivener. And so I use Scrivener for writing my stories and then I use Microsoft Office to edit things out afterwards. So I find with a short story with this, I can export directly to Microsoft Office and everything I need is there for a quick, clean edits and to tidy things up. And the same thing if it's a longer piece, like a novel, I can export everything to my Scrivener program and it all is laid out logically and intelligently and I can easily just write things in and with Scrivener, as those of you who know the program know, it allows you to brain dump everything onto the page and then it cuts out the clutter when you do a final export from it into Microsoft Office. It cuts out the clutter and brings it. So the fact that these programs connect and merge with each other so perfectly, uh, it's just, it's a massive time saver and wonderful to work with. It is huge. I actually started using Plotter before there was a Scrivener expert and I am a Scrivener user and there was a lot of copying and pasting that I don't have to do anymore. And I absolutely love that part of the process. <laughs> um, so I love it when other people do that as well. Um, yeah. So a couple more questions for you. Do you have any books or resources that you'd recommend that helped you get to this point and kind of where you are as, the, as a writer? I would say uh, definitely the Save the Cat books, as uh, Save the Cat, Save the Cat writes a novel. Uh, there's Writer's Digest a while ago, came out with a book, uh, Crafting Novels and Short Stories. And oh, yeah. Stephen King's On Writing is another one. Um, but the one thing that I would say is, there's also a book that someone mentioned to me, which was How to Write Dazzling Dialogue. Uh, and while it was, it's effective in some ways. There's other ways that I found it less effective. And that's one of my key things that I would say, and I say to my followers, is read anything and everything. Read books you don't like, read genres you don't like, read books you love, read books, uh, good books on writing, bad books on writing. The thing is, read mindfully. If you read a very specific scene that makes you feel very excited, stop. Why did it make you excited? How was it written? Was it the character? Was it the pacing? Was it the plot points? 
What was it? Dissect it. And it's the same thing. If you're reading a book that you really disliked, why did you dislike it? Don't just put it away. Yeah. Did you dislike how it was written? Was it confusing? Was the plot line too contrived? Were the characters unlikable? And if you can start doing this and interacting with yourself and pulling apart any and every book that you read, television show, movie, series, any of that stuff, that can factor into your writing and allow you to see, okay, I know I want to avoid that or I know I want to factor this in. That is actually great. That is also why people hate watching movies with authors, especially <laughs> mystery authors who go, I already know who did it. They're like, yeah. just be quiet. Don't, don't tell us. That's um, it. Or the, uh, you know, the, this is really well written because of this, like you enjoyed that. Because, like, I don't care why yeah. I enjoyed it. Just. I don't care why I enjoyed it. I just want to watch the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I get that a lot. I get that a lot. Um, so what's your number one tip for someone planning short stories? If you could give them just one tip, what is that? Going back to what Stephen King said about cups and handles to make a mug, you've got a cup, which is kind of a story idea and handles, which can accentuate it and make it into a mug when you marry it together. When you get a really good story idea, put it down in plotter, go through the drawers of your mind, pull out a bunch of different handles, put them into the plotter. It's easy to put them in, easy to take there them out, go. see what matches up and uh, you'll find your way. You'll find your way through to a whole cupboard of mugs eventually. Excellent. And that mentioning of mugs leads me to, of course, our question of the day that we ask every guest. And since you live somewhere where it's very cold, Ottawa, Canada, by the way, which um, how cold is it going to be there tomorrow? Uh, tonight, uh, this evening and overnight is supposed to be minus 30. Minus 30. So, so Travis lives in a place where air hurts his face, um, which is unfortunate. So I have to ask you about the proper beverage for such weather, coffee or tea and cream or no cream? Oh, uh, I would say in the morning, a big carafe of coffee uh, with some cream in it, depending on the coffee. If it's uh, certain coffees, you can't mix cream with. Um, and in the evening uh, or during the day, I really love uh, Egyptian licorice tea to sip on. Ooh. Egyptian licorice tea. That is fantastic. You take cream or sugar with that, or is that just straight up? That's just straight. It's the, the tea itself, it changes your taste buds. It gives you a nice refreshing kick when you inhale afterwards, uh, but it will make everything you eat for the next 20 minutes taste weird. <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us. I really do appreciate that. We appreciate your time and sharing your process with us. Uh, tell people where they can stock, I, I mean, find you online. Um, and then we'll drop those in the Facebook comments later. Of course, I, I've tried to make it as easy as possible. So my website is thecalmscribe.ca and all of my social media handles are at thecalmscribe and my Twitch is twitch.tv slash thecalmscribe. So if I Google the calm scribe, I'm probably in good shape. You'll probably find some stuff. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us, everybody. And we'll see you next time on Thursdays with Troy.